Okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar session. Uh, my name is Fernando and I come with the Region 9 Head Start Association and I welcome you all. Um, I will be your webinar host today, so feel free to contact me via the chat option of Zoom with any logistic questions you may have regarding audio, video, or any connection issues you may experience uh, throughout today's session. Uh, please note that due to the current events related to COVID-19, our webinar platform Zoom is experiencing a high volume of activity. So if you experience any lag and or constant connection issues, uh, we apologize in advance for the inconvenience. With that said, as a registered attendee, you will have the ability to log back into the session at any time. This webinar session will be recorded and will be made available for on-demand consumption up on our YouTube channel within 24 hours. You may access our YouTube channel by visiting our website at www.region9hsa.org. And then scrolling all the way down to the bottom of our homepage where you will find a link to our YouTube account. We encourage your participation today so there will be three opportunities throughout today's session where we will pause and up and up the room for, for you to submit your questions and or comments. To contact us, you may use the Q&A option of Zoom or you can use the chat. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our topic for today, seize the opportunity. Now is the time to provide remote professional development for your teachers. And our presenter today will be John Gunnerson. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. My pleasure to be with you and indeed to seize the opportunity. Uh, I find that now is the time to provide remote professional development for our teachers to look at the opportunity of us all being sheltered in place. Gives us an unusual window for digital professional development. So today we're going to uh, first look at the challenge. Um, most of our centers are closed throughout Region 9. We're feeling anxious, uncertain, uh, unable to control our future. Just watching the news creates anxiety. And we know that our teachers are at home, working, um, many of them receiving pay. So that's the COVID-19 situation. Looking at our program itself, we know that the quality of our program varies. It's a uh, slippery slope that we're always climbing to try and improve and to attain high quality. Last constant development scores, so one big area where we've been slipping, instructional support overall has always lagged behind. And you know that we never have enough time for professional development during our normal work. Now that has changed. That creates a challenge. But this challenge today, what I'm going to try to do with you is to look at giving you opportunity strategies to provide safe professional development that meets the needs of your specific program. Not something can be something that structure for you to to develop remote professional development using existing online platform and how you can format your remote professional development with an engaging interactive structure. So considerations. Um, I think it's important for each of us to assess our staff. What is their motivation level for engaging in professional development. If this is something that they've had a lot of a successful professional development, they're going to be excited to be able to spend some of their at-home time doing this. They will be committed to it. Or many of our head staff, our teachers have had so much professional development where they look at, oh, it's another asthma training, um, that they've learned to have procedural display where they're present, meeting the requirements, but really not engaged. So I think it's incumbent upon us to start our professional development that's remote at the level where our teachers are and to build commitment. Also looking that there's, they have a diversity of technology tools. Many of our teachers have access to computer, to laptop, internet, um, not all. 
And that's something very important for you to understand because you don't want to leave staff behind. What is their access to a smartphone or to a landline? Using some platforms, such as uh, Zoom that we're on now, you staff who do not have a computer can still phone in and participate. And then what are your expectations? What are your teacher's expectations? If this is viewed just as a requirement, you're not going to achieve much, achieve much. But if it's an opportunity to go in depth and to really take this time to develop our reflection skills, our planning skills, and to build on it over time, then we can achieve more. So you have to start in nurture creating a culture of professional development. Since we seem to be in COVID-19 for a while, probably the entire month of April, if not longer, we um, carefully consider what kind of scheduling should we have? I think one hour, maybe an hour and a half per day maximum online for kind of a professional development session that you are facilitating is a certain amount of time with additional time for where your staff may be doing some practicum, some reading, or some planning. Platforms, uh, I just listed some of them. We're using Zoom, which seems to be the go-to platform that people are using right now. Uh, you can do meetings, video webinar, there's conference room. They've got various levels. The, at the free level, uh, which is the basic, it's new meetings are limited to um, one host up to 100 participants and only 40 minutes. But if you start to pay, uh, you can increase, uh, for example, at their small and medium business level, $20 per month, you can have up to 10 hosts and 300 meetings. And Zoom does have this share screen function, so you can both be showing your face and you're talking and then uh, switch to a PowerPoint. And uh, they now have a virtual background. So instead of showing the wall of your study, you can have a, a different background behind you. And they have the uh, potential for video. Uh, Fernando sharing with me, they are having some problems with the increased use of Zoom with high definition video. So that's something to look at. Uh, yeah, Tom, I've had some experience with that. They operate from Chrome and Firefox. It's free for, for personal use, only for four participants with one meeting room. But you can increase with $9.99 per month at the pro level. You can use uh, three meeting rooms with one user and four participants. And for $60 per month, you can have multiple users, 10 meeting rooms, and 50 participants. Then there's also meetings, hangouts, continue.com or continue.com, however you want to pronounce it, it is uh, not a platform, but with Nine, we have many professional development webinars available there. So that's something that you could use for the participants to view on their own independently and then have follow-up practicum activities and discussion. So some upgrades beyond your laptops to look at is the microphone, the camera and the lighting. Uh, and many of our microphones uh, are, are off of our laptop and are not of the highest quality. So you might consider uh, the Snowball mic. Fernando recommends that, and it's only $40 to $50 available uh, walking through the internet and at Best Buy. And these are some of the other recommendations. I use them both, they have come highly recommended. So, the uh, structure, the heart of today's webinar uh, is this framework that I've been developing over the last week or so around how do we provide professional development that's in-depth and meaningful. I think just as in in-person professional development, there always needs to be a check-in, a buy-in to, to bring the group together. Having a focus for your professional development so that it's not just one hour this and one hour and that, but it's sustained, I think that's important. Having a framework that's so that you're not trying to cover lots and lots and lots of points, but a framework of three to seven different ways that you're addressing the topic. 
then meeting to address it that people can do on their own or during your webinar. Um, scenarios, applying it to the classroom, video clips available, and always planning for the next steps. So this is the heart of today's webinar. I many times because I'm going to go through each section and come back to it. So starting with check-in, building a caring community. This is where you have to look at your commitment of your staff and find out kind of what, um, what level at right now, what's their buy-in into remote professional development. So some of the options. Uh, I'm aware of check-ins because check-in can on to some training sessions where the check-ins end up taking half or more of the entire time allotted. So to limit that, you can have a one word or one sentence check-in. How are you feeling right now? You know, concerned, on the edge, happy, relaxed. Uh, you can have a one minute check-in where you have a, a time. Uh, and this is where you can have a little bell. And indeed, after one minute, you, you hit your chime. That works well for a small number of participants for less than 10. Remember, if you've got 10 participants, that's going to be 10 minutes. If you've got 30 participants, that's 30 minutes, which is a long time. An open-ended check-in, if you've got a lot of time, if you've got a very small group. At the beginning of your remote professional development, you may want to start in with a prompting question on coronavirus. What's one strategy you're using to stay positive? How is shelter in place affecting you and your family? What is the one thing that you're missing because of shelter in the place? Now, this is likely to prompt emotions. And indeed, if you're starting a whole series of everyday remote professional development, which I advocate, this may be your whole first session, just a check-in on coronavirus. Over time, you We'll do check-ins and what I find in during in-person professional development is a prompting question on the training topic. So for example, if I was focusing on class analysis and reasoning, I'd ask what's one road, roadblock or problem that you had with trying to help children develop their thinking. We've been using class for four years. What is one positive outcome you've seen? Or why is it hard for all of us to implement the class analysis and reasoning behavioral markers? So depending on the size of your group, you might have everyone check in and so that you're aware of it. So if I'm working with 10 to 15, ideally, then I would have each person respond to this question and still might have a, a, a chime in the background to indicate, let, to wrap it up. Uh, if I've got a larger group, if I have a large group of teachers of 30 or more, then I'm just going to ask a couple of people to share. And I might, because they're my own staff, ask in advance for some people to prepare their response. So after the check-in, I think it's important to look at what is your focus going to be for your professional development. So I believe that we should select one focus for in-depth professional development. Less is more. And by that, I mean taking one topic and spending multiple days, a week, multiple weeks on it, drilling deep enables your staff to understand it, to internalize the information, to plan for it, and hopefully to impact their teaching practices. So some possible uh, topics that could be focused. Behavior management. I think with everyday remote professional development, you could spend three, four weeks on that. Class concept development. So you could take each one of these indicators and spend time on it. The implementation of studies or the project approach. Or early math, taking from the uh, California uh, preschool curriculum framework, you could focus a week or more just on number sense or algebra and functions, measurement, et cetera. Same thing with language and literacy, really drilling down deep. So what that might look like as an example is if I'm focusing on class, uh, on instructional support, I might spend the week, this week, March 30th to April 3rd, every day doing different aspects of analysis and reasoning. 
and then next week go into creating, and then the week after into integration, and then connections to the real world. Now all of these, I'm, put, I'm saying one week, five days of an hour each of professional development on a topic, that this will be like an accordion, and you can expand it or contract it accordingly. But my experience is, is that staff respond best, and they develop their competency, and they develop some self-confidence when they fully understand the topic. I've done in-person professional development on analysis and reasoning. I did it with one Head Start Center. We spent the entire day, six hours, just on analysis and reasoning. And I'm in, in the rest of this webinar, I'm giving you more information about how you can unpack these topics. So then if I'm spending most of April on concept development, I might move into quality of feedback in May, scaffolding, feedback loops, prompting thought processes. And then hopefully uh, by mid-May, we're gonna be back in our centers. If not, I can continue to go deeper with language modeling or pick up some of the indicators in class. Or after six weeks uh, with a focus on concept development quality feedback, we want, might wanna to move to a different topic, looking at, for example, maybe emerging writing and how we're doing sign-in, and how we're doing model writing, and what our writing center looks like. So after you decide on your focus, then I think you need a framework for how you're going to structure your online sessions. So I think the framework should address both the topic, the topic both for remote professional development and for classroom implementation. The strongest, Professional development enables the participants to internalize the knowledge and to be able to act on it. And at this point, where we don't know when we're going to be returning to working in our classrooms, do some planning for the classroom implementation. The framework is going to change depending on what your focus is, but it needs to be concrete. And you want to break it into understandable chunks. Uh, people can only, in their brain, remember between five and seven discrete, uh, unrelated uh, uh, facts. Or More than that, they lose it. So we need to keep it uh, somewhere around five to seven uh, big chunks of information. Let me just do a quick activity for you. I'm going to say uh, seven numbers, and I'm going to ask you to say them to yourself. I'm not going to hear that, but you'll, we'll, we'll just see how this goes. So I'm going to say seven numbers and then pause for you to say them to yourself. We'll see how good you are at remembering them. Eight, nine, five, nine, three, two. Okay, and I suspect that most of you were able to Say them back. Now I'm try 10 and let's see how that goes. I will say 10 numbers and you say them back to me. One, four, nine, five, six, three, one, seven, zero, nine. Now I suspect many of you are chuckling to yourself about how difficult that was, unless you cheated and wrote them down. But just remembering 10 unrelated bits of information is too difficult for most of us. This is why um, telephone numbers are seven numbers. And the, an area code, though, 415, 510, 380, we say it so often it becomes one chunk. So in our professional development, we need to keep our the big topics, the framework, into five to seven different areas so that people can remember them and grab onto it. When there's 10 or more, it gets lost. So I'm going today use uh, analysis and reasoning from class as a primary example. So first, we're given the framework of the five behavioral markers that comes from Teach Stone, uh, which many of us are familiar. So this gives us a framework to go in depth in each one of them. And I will submit that after four years or so of in-depth uh, professional development in class, most of our teachers don't really understand this, and very few of them, if you ask what are the behavioral markers for analysis and reasoning, very few of them would be able to, um, to give 
all five. Then we've got the, the behavioral markers. The second part of the framework would be just these three points. Develop a full understanding of them. What does problem solving mean? What does asking why and how questions really mean? So developing that. And then do some planning for it in advance. So for storybook reading or small, going into a small group activity or going into lunchtime, having some questions planned around analysis and reasoning. So how can we do that? And then the third is how can we do this on the spot? When you join a child on the area, use analysis and reasoning. So this framework is really the three points of understand it, plan it in advance for a couple of uh, times during your daily routine, and then try it out and experiment with on the spot strategies. So let's take this down into problem solving, which is one of the behavioral markers for analysis and reasoning. So I would want my teachers to fully understand what problem solving means. We do some reading, I would prepare some slides, we'd talk about that. And then plan how to use it. So if we're gonna read brown bear, brown bear, instead of just asking the kind of questions uh, that are obvious, that are recall or rote memory functions from the book, like what are all the animals uh, that are in the book brown bear, brown bear, or what are the colors of the animals, and how can I ask a problem solving question? Well, brown bear, brown bear, tomorrow is his birthday. He wants to have a birthday party and invite all the different animals, but there's COVID-19 going on. How should he have his party? That's a problem solving question. That's kind of an extension from the book. Or if you don't, that's kind of an adult focused question. You could also ask, so brown bear, brown bear, he wants to go on vacation, but he can't just go to Disneyland like people do. And he can't go to uh, ride on the roller coaster at Santa Cruz. Uh, and he's always in the mountains. So he's wondering where he should go for a vacation. So what are your ideas around that? So we would plan that through our remote professional development, some, some intentionally planned activities. We, we're, how we're going to use problem solving during storybook reading, during small group time activities, during meal times. And we're going to develop the on-the-spot strategies. So at this point, let me stop and see if we've got any questions from the group. Hi, John, thank you. Um, so there are no questions. However, I did want to point out, um, folks are having issues hearing you. It seems that we're experiencing some audio connection issues. So your voice is going in and out. Um, and I'm alerting folks that it seems like it's improving, uh, but not for everybody. So um, if you could uh, maybe just uh, continue with this nice space that you're going in, and if uh, connections continue uh, giving us problems, then we'll, we'll switch to a call-in setup on the next uh, stopping point you have. I just wanted to make sure you, you're aware of this. Okay, thank you. So after we have our focus and our framework, then we get into the nitty gritty of it. Uh, so I think one way to do that is curated readings. And what I'm saying is by curated, carefully choosing what's gonna be appropriate for your staff. So you provide your participants with a paragraph, a page, or an article to read and discuss, either on their own, in advance of the online session, something that you could email to them or send them a link to, or online embedded in the online session. So something that they would read on the screen. I think it's important to also assess the reading skills of your teacher and to be, not just assume that everyone's going to be able to read. What is their ability to comprehend? Uh, the content and the vocabulary. And what are their reading skills in English versus reading skills in their home language? So some readings are available in Spanish or Chinese. Uh, I developed a number of um, handouts on each of the class instructional support 
uh, indicators and had them translated into Chinese and Spanish. And be glad to share those with people if needed. But they're basically two pages on analysis and reasoning and two pages on prompting thought processes, et cetera. And of course, with, if, if we're gonna have them read, then we want to develop discussion questions that are based on the curated reading. So it's not just read it to get it done because it's an assignment, but to internalize it and understand it. So for example, uh, this is part of a reading from the class pre-K manual, which has good examples of high, medium, and low ratings for each of the dimensions. So this is just a part of it. So for example, with analysis and reasoning. During your book reading, the teacher focuses on facts on a traditional recall format, asking students questions such as, what animal was in the story? What is the lion's name? Or what letter does the lion begin with? The teacher does not solicit ideas focused on analysis and reasoning from the students, such as asking why something may have happened in the story or what may happen next. Instead, the teacher is solely focused on the student's ability to recall facts from the story. During circle time, the teacher may ask the students whether it is raining, but does not elaborate on what happens when it rains or what you might need to wear if it is raining. He is merely asking for a yes or no response. He may ask students how many more boys than girls are in the class or what day comes after Monday, but he does not ask these questions in the context of a discussion in which he expects the answers to be anything more than rote. So this is taking all that gray matter that we have in the class manual and bringing out a, a, a sustained but limited amount of text. I would indeed read this to the participants. Some people are capable of reading it fully on their own. Some, if English is not their home language and they have variable reading skills, it will be useful for them to hear the oral words. And then I could ask them some questions. What are your reflections on this classroom and teacher? What are the children learning? And with what are the children learning, you may say, well, they're not learning really anything. No, they're, I think it's important at this point to go into the fact that the children are learning to give the teachers right answers. They're actually learning not to think. Why is this problematic? Is rote learning good or bad and why? And actually, and that's a close-ended question. Rote learning is good. Uh, we, we do need to learn certain things by rote, but if the full emphasis is on rote learning, then children learn not to develop executive functioning skills. So that could be unpacked. And then of course, what could you do different? What could we do about the animals and the stories and how could we take that and do it differently? Or what might we ask about the weather or the rain? So it's raining today. Well, how do you know that it's raining? And then at the other, the, at the higher end of the spectrum, the teacher may ask students to make a picture using three different colors of paint and to see how many different colors they can make from the three paints provided. The teacher does not simply give this task to the students and walk away, but instead stays with them and encourages them to talk and think about the process by asking questions or pushing them to experiment in different ways. A teacher working at the corn table with students using cups of different shapes and sizes might say, I wonder how many of the green cups would fit in the red cup? Or, hmm, how can you tell which one of these is bigger? The students may then work independently, but they have a framework for using the corn table as a learning opportunity rather than just for pouring corn back and forth between the two cups. And then again, I would ask some questions around that. Uh, what are your reflections? What are the children learning? When you facilitate the painting activity, what questions and statements might you make? Um, how should we choose what we put into our sand and water table? I think this is an important question because too often I see our tables are just full of stuff that Cool Whip containers, yogurt containers, and a miscellaneous variety of plastic materials that we bought from Lakeshore Discount School Supply. Whereas if we, if we can move our staff to starting to intentionally think about what do we put in there? What's the right amount? Is five containers too many or too little? Or 10 containers too many too little? What should they be? What are the different textures? 
what is going to appeal to the children. Very often we put in way too much stuff and it, it, and it clutters up the activity. And how can we facilitate children's thinking when they are at our sand and water table? Now, even though this, what I've quoted in this reading is from the class pre-K manual, I would encourage you to adapt it. I find class always uses students. For Head Start, I would change that to children. Most of us would not have a corn table because that's a food, so you could change that to sand and water table and adapt it in any other ways that are appropriate. So then scenarios. This is one of my favorite areas. So a scenario is a concrete example that applies directly to the curriculum or the everyday activities in a Head Start or early Head Start classroom. So the appropriate scenarios include case studies, classroom photos as provocations, storybooks, curriculum ideas, documentation. What we're trying to do with scenarios is make it concrete so that teachers can, their thinking can shift from the idea behind the professional development, behind the concept, to what I'm gonna actually do. And I believe strongly that scenarios always include questions that encourage reflection and problem solving. So looking at uh, analysis and reasoning. The teacher puts on a short puppet show with two puppets who fight over a truck. Then they decide to take turns. Was this a good solution? How should we solve our problem with our friends instead of fighting? So very simple scenario. What are your reflections about how this adult and how could you do differently? So here, a lot of people might say, well, this is good because you have the idea of problem solving. But this is kind of spoon-fed problem solving. It doesn't allow the children to think. As opposed to the teacher puts on a short puppet show with two puppets who fight over a truck. How could the puppets solve their problem? The child suggests that the two puppets share, which I find children always have to share, she should share. Okay, how do you think that solution might work? Why might it work? Why might it not work? And I think this is very important for when children can get to the point that sharing might not work because it's hard. So then what's another possible solution? So in this scenario then are thinking questions. What are your reflections about this, how this adult is teaching problem solving skills? What are the children learning? What could you do differently? I always like to ask, what could you do differently? Because even in the best scenario, People will do it in their own way. So using storybooks. We should be using multiple storybooks during the day. And storybooks have many um, positive outcomes. They're developing children's listening skills, developing a disposition to fall in love with books. It's also an opportunity to develop their analysis and reasoning skills. So an example, after reading The Three Little Pigs, what problem solving questions could we ask? Well, instead of blowing down their houses, what could the wolf have done to get the pigs? You know, maybe he could have lured them out by offering them uh, some ice cream. Is the wolf bad for wanting to eat the pigs? What could he have done instead? If he's, if he's hungry, instead of eating the pigs, what could he have done? Well, maybe he could have gone to McDonald's. Maybe he could have gone to, uh, a restaurant. Maybe he could have gone to a supermarket and bought his own food and cooked it up. So that's an example that I would present and then apply that to reading The Hungry Caterpillar. And then what problem solving questions could we present to our children around the Hungry Caterpillar. So when you, the idea is that when you read the book, you pre-plan some analysis and reasoning questions. And we could go through all of the books that we're going to read for the say, four weeks coming back and plan out analysis and reasoning questions, one or two questions for every single book. Strategy I like to do is get the small yellow post-it notes that are about one inch by one inch and you write your analysis and reasoning question on that post-it note, and then you attach it in the corner on the page where you're going to ask that question. So for example, in The Hungry Caterpillar, on the very last page where there's the beautiful butterfly, 
I might ask, write down, what is a butterfly going to do next? Where is the butterfly going to go? That's a prediction question from analysis and reasoning. And so I'm going to have that post-it note right there on the last page, or on the very first page, uh, where the egg appears on the leaf. On the full moon, I might ask the question and write it down in a post-it note. Who laid the egg? Or where did the egg come from? It's a good analysis and reasoning question because most children think that the, the mother of the egg is the caterpillar. They don't make the connection that it is indeed the butterfly. So you can do the same thing with analysis and reasoning for finger plays. So after singing Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star, when we're lined up to go outdoors or go into the bathroom or whatever, we sing the song and then you ask one question. And such as, if I wanted to visit a star, how could I get there? And of course, the children are going to say, a rocket ship. Well, if I have to invent something new that's different from a rocket ship, what could I invent to get to a star? How could I get to a star without going in a rocket ship? So that's an analysis and reasoning question. What I'm trying to get at it this, through this professional development is that we use finger plays and storybooks multiple times every day. And if we could plan to always ask one analysis and reasoning question at the end of, this, of the book or in the middle of the book or, and at the end of the finger play, that would be institutionalizing analysis and reasoning into our daily routine. So at this point, I would say wheels on bus, which is practically the national anthem for Head Start classrooms. Everybody sings the wheel on the bus. So what problem solving questions could we ask the children? You sing the wheels and go round and round. You go through it and then say, the teacher, I've got a question to ask you. So um, how could a mommy on the bus get the baby to stop crying without going shh, shh? What else could she do? And then get a response. Or what could the daddy the daddy in the bus wakes up because the baby's crying and the mommy gives him the crying baby and she takes a nap. So what could the daddy do to get the baby to stop crying? And there are numerous, numerous other questions that you could come up with. So I also like to use uh, pictures. So for example, this is a provocation that's set up for Play-Doh. So what problem solving questions could I ask? So this is already well set up. Instead of just giving a glob of Play-Doh and a plastic bin full of uh, cookie cutters, which I don't recommend. Uh, here's a teacher. She's got it set up with a provocation uh, in the middle of slices of Play-Doh to look like pizza. Each child has a ball of Play-Doh that's smushed out. So a problem solving question could be, so you've got a small pizza and there are three of us. So how can you make this cut the pizza so that each of the three of us has the same number of pieces? And that could be three pieces, it could be six pieces, it could be one and a half pieces each. Uh, and you could change the number depending on the thinking level of your children to five children or six children or four children or eight children. Another example, what problem solving question could I ask here? Just shelf in the block area with two cars on it. Well, these two cars, drivers up on the top shelf, when we, when we go out to play, they like get off the shelf and zoom around. But somebody, one of the kids in the class, left them parked on the top shelf. Now they can't fly, so how are they gonna get down to zoom around while we're all outside? What do they need? Another scenario. This is one of my favorites. What's wrong with this conversation? Teacher, what color are the leaves? Green and red. I see yellow too. Are the leaves big or small? Small. Some are medium. Are any of the leaves big? No. Nope. None of them are big. Where do the leaves come from? The tree, the flower, the store. Teacher, what letter does the leaf start with? I don't know. With a little itty bitty bud on the branch. Teacher, leaf starts with an L. Can everyone say L? L! 
I go outside now? So this is, unfortunately, an all too common conversation that I hear with, hearing in the Head Start classrooms. Uh, it would be good to analyze what do, what do people see in this? I have used this many times in in-person professional development sessions. Uh, at one site, everybody thought it was a pretty good conversation. So that gave me insight to understanding that we had a lot of work to do. <laughs> okay, so at this point, uh, let me again see if we have any questions that we want to address. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, we do actually have a few questions. So let me um, go through them fairly quick. Um, but before, uh, thanks everybody for your patience with the audio issues. It seems like it's improving. So um, thanks again for, for, uh, uh, for your patience. So the first uh, question we received as how do you suggest starting remote professional development for teachers who have low technical skills? So teachers with low technical skills, um, it depends on uh, whether or not they have internet access. You could do this through, um, through Zoom just using the call-in function and doing the check-in. Um, so with a small group, I don't, if you've got a large center like many of us have, I would get my management staff together and have a call with each person individually to assess, do they have the capability to go online onto Zoom? Um, and can they do that where they, with the video function or only with the call-in function and actually provide a tutorial for each one of them. So the advantage of this working at home is that we have a lot of staff who are available and most of our programs have an IT person. So it's not unfeasible to do a call-in tutorial with each person to kind of help them get up to line. And then we can assess how many of my staff are going to be able to see my PowerPoint and how many of them are gonna be able to hear it. And then for your first session, I would probably do exactly like we're doing, where I'm the presenter, you have you, yourself, the education program manager, the director is someone who's the content specialist, and then you have someone such as Fernanda, who's the IT specialist who can problem solve with people. Keep it short the first time. You want to provide enough support so that people feel successful, that they can get that the IT part of it, the technological part of it does not become a roadblock. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question we have in the queue um, says, wondering what you're finding the needs are for unpacking the trauma, stress, and issues everyone is facing due to the pandemic, personally and professionally, and how to do professional development around that to support the workforce in processing the current reality. Oh, that's, a, that's a variable answer to that, depending on your staff. I think that's exactly where we need to start. With, before, before you get into content, early childhood, Head Start specific traditional content, you need to, for people to feel safe and to feel a part of a larger community. And now we're feeling isolated. So this is where you might look at... Um, your, who, who do you have in your staff, social worker, mental health specialist, who can help you have your first couple of sessions a week, maybe even two weeks, where you unpack this. And where I would structure it, where you ask some questions, find out how people are feeling, how they're feeling supported, who is alone, who, you know, people who live by themselves, who has families, and there's pluses and minuses for each one of those. So I think we could develop a whole series of open-ended questions to have some experience around that. But I would not feel comfortable facilitating that entirely on my own. You know, I'm, my area of specialty is early childhood education, not mental health. So I'm gonna to wanna to have someone to be a part of that. Uh, we don't have to be psychiatrists to do that but we want to be able to support people because some people may be, may be struggling a lot and want be wanting to reach out to the entire group around that. And I think we need to be prepared to provide the referrals, the support if needed. Uh, 
and also not provide, not try to facilitate information that is inaccurate. Great, and then um, the last question and then we'll move on. Um, do you have some examples about topics that might address the teachers, children, and families' anxiety around changes in routine and the unknown consequences of the virus? Have you seen any well-designed online trainings around how teachers might keep connected with their families and teachers during this crisis? What about anything to address the, te the technology gaps? I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part of the question. So the last part of the question was, uh, what about anything or any training to address the technology gaps? Okay, uh, to address the technology gap, I know that uh, Zoom has some tutorials and some orientation as I think all of the online platforms do. So that, that, that tends to be variable in the level that people are able to access that information and understand it and use it. I believe that the best way is individual reaching out. Again, from your management team, contact each person, find out where they are and how you can support them. People, people want that personal contact since we're not having that. In terms of the training around uh, COVID-19 specifically, I have not seen anything well designed that's put out there. I think we're at the beginning of that stage right now. I know teachers are working at uh, how to provide curriculum and your training could be on how we are. So for example, one of the sites that I'm working with San Francisco, uh, providing materials for the parents to pick up. So I live out in the country, I have a compost pile. So I gave them a couple of hundred worms and they're dividing them up into little um, baby food jars and giving each child some soil with about three or four worms in it. And then we've developed a whole, a two page list of activities. Name the worms and write them out and measure the worms and take them out once a day and put them on a white piece of paper and try to answer these questions through your observations. You know, what do worms like to do? Do worms like to play with each other or do they like to be apart from each other? How do worms move? Um, do an observational drawing of a worm. Which end is the head? How many lines does a worm have? Do worms poo? And so this gives a, a, a structure for the families and for the children to kind of begin to look at scientific inquiry as a part of that process. Bottom line is, is we're figuring this out as we're kind of flying the airplane as we build it. And I think that uh, we might use this platform of Region 9 Head Start Association to share some of that information. Great, thank you, John. Um, we do have some additional questions that just came in, but just to uh, be mindful of the time, let's move forward. And if time permits, we'll address these live. Um, on the next Q&A um, section. If not, we'll follow up via email. Okay. So video clips. I think video clips can be, as a part of our framework, part of our structure, very, very effective. So I just wanted to list them. I think we're all aware of the Head Start uh, video clips that are available. Class has the video library, which I think many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with. They are also a variable quality. However, you can use clips that you are not, do not think are high quality and you can analyze them. I like the raw video footage that the class video library has. HighScope also has um, a number of raw footage. And by raw footage, I mean there's no narrative, there's no interpretation, it's just showing the children playing or the teacher child interactions. A great one that I've used many times is presenting the new Mrs. Spears. This is about a teacher working with a couple of little girls in the dramatic play area, uh, pretending that it's a beauty salon and one of the little girls is Britney Spears. Um, the teaching channel also has a number of good videos. One of my favorites is hypothesizing about bugs, uh, which was filmed uh, at Pacific Primary in San Francisco. 
And Videotives also has a number of raw footage clips. These are for available for purchase. So just to go a little bit deeper with that, to contrast some video clips. So Exploring Roly Polies is uh, a Head Start video that's available. And this shows a good small group activity led by a teacher, uh, but not great. And so I think very often we, we show something that's very, very good at a high level and, and maybe contrast it with something that's at a very low level. But I think exploring roly polies, you can look at it and then analyze what did you do differently? And how are the children prepared? How are the teacher prepared? As opposed to the hypothesizing about bugs, which is not just about roly polies, but other ones, and then carefully analyze what are the strategies the teachers use. So some prompting questions for that is what are the children learning in this video clip? What teaching strategies are being used by the teacher? How could this activity be strengthened further? Which of these skills can you develop into your teaching repertoire and how? So I would encourage you, uh, I was gonna show these, but because of our unstable use of video, I just put the links in there. So look at each one of these, copy that link and um, look at them. They're each four or five minutes long, not too long, but a good contrasting video that you could use. I think just showing one video and debriefing it for about a half hour and then going into the other hypothesizing about bugs, debriefing it for about half hour, that would be your entire professional development session for that day. Before showing a video clip, what I like to do, I mean, video is great, but very often teachers just, they, they get entertained by it. I want to move beyond entertainment to reflection. So a structure for doing that is before showing the video clip, give each participant a role and a lens to look at. So I might assign some people to observe and pay attention to the teacher, what she saw, does, what she says. Another group to pay attention to the children, how they respond to the teacher and to the activity. And then my third group to pay attention to the materials, how they support or limit children's play. So when I do in-person professional development, we just number off one, two, three, one, two, three, and all the ones pay attention to the teacher, the twos, the children, the, the threes pay attention to the materials. Uh, if I'm doing this online, I would, since I'm doing it with my center and I know who's online, I would just assign people a role. And then when they're, after we've seen that, ask the people who observe the teacher to share what they observed. And so we'll have a little bit of discussion and have multiple people sharing. And then the people who observe the children and what they observed, and then the people who observed the materials. Then we might video, view the video again to observe specific interaction strategies. So especially in hypothesizing around bugs, I like them to notice what, what's the culture of that classroom? What skills do the children already have coming into that small group activity? What are the teacher's expectations? And then discuss how we can develop and use this interaction strategy in our own center, in our own classrooms. And then finally, next steps. Just as in in-person professional development, I don't want at four o'clock everybody to go out and do a brain dump and forget all about it. How can we, research from Stanford has shown that within 48 hours, 90% is lost. How do we prevent that from happening? So I like to close with the participants sharing what was meaningful from today's session or what content they can apply to the teaching once they return to their classroom. I want to avoid the train and forget syndrome and provide one or more next steps to continue the professional development. So again, some options to think about. They could uh, read an article online and pre be prepared to respond to specific discussion questions during our online professional development tomorrow. They could talk on the phone or online with the co-teacher. You could even develop a buddy system where two teachers or even three teachers get together and talk on the phone or use Zoom or whereby to talk. Or take a children's book that they have at home and develop some strategies to expand on this book using uh, the content the strategies that we discussed today. Okay, so that's kind of a big briefly give some ideas about how you might apply that beyond looking at class analysis and reasoning, which is the example. Excuse me. So for creative curriculum studies, a framework is 
the studies themselves, beginning the study, investigating and concluding it. Curated readings. So using the uh, Creative Curriculum for Preschool Teaching Guide, in the example here on the closed study, I might take each one of the investigation questions. And I find that to make the teaching guides useful and applicable to our centers, they need to, we need to make them much more specific to our environments. Teaching Strategies wrote these to market them all across the United States, but to make them work for your classroom in Arizona or in California, you need to, if we're gonna look at what are the features of clothes, we need to investigate that based on what's right here. So, some questions that I might use. How can we facilitate our children to investigate each question in depth? What resources do we have in our immediate environment that will help our children to answer this question? How will our clothes study be different from a theme on clothes. I find too often studies are being implemented and they are really teacher directed theme units rather than real investigation. So if you look at, for example, um, maybe we get a pile of clothes that have been donated and we look at the labels and we find out what those labels say. What does SML mean? And when it says made in Bangladesh, made in China, what does that mean? And we get out a globe and of course, the globe or a world map is going to be abstract to our children, but that's a way of going deeper with the content. And then scenarios. I find looking at case studies of other projects or studies is very, very useful and reflecting on them and analyzing. So I've listed here some resources, case studies uh, on the, from the Project Approach website on dogs, chairs, bones, uh, Katrina, school bus project, a lunch project. Um, the Cole Children's Museum in Chicago also has a collection of write-ups of different projects and studies on aquarium, bakery, babies, beauty salon, clothing tools, and how to make tortillas and worms. And then different books on studies in the project approach. Each, although these books that I'm listed all are larger, they have some great case studies within them. So, <clears throat> For example, The 100 Languages of Children has a great example of uh, children investigating where their dads work. This is actually based in Chicago. Another example of children making a mural of a dinosaur. So you could take any one of these and pull out the case study, and then you could look at how these went in depth. And the last, behavior management. <clears throat> I think you need to, your teachers need a framework for the challenging issues around behavior management. And whether you're using second step or parent effectiveness training or whatever, your teachers need a framework for how they're gonna respond because this is just too complex. So this is just an example that I use in the professional development that I provide, which is options for responding to behavior problems. Whenever there's a behavioral issue, you've got some options. You can ignore it which only works if no one is gonna get hurt and there's no ownership in it by you. You can restructure the environment. You could direct the behavior, tell the child what to do, which is what most people do and is the least effective. Or you could offer choices or problem solve. And of course each, so that's our framework and each one of those is gonna be, might be in depth explained and practiced. And then you can do a curated reading. And so this is, I actually have developed a number of pages around this. Management and copy a page and email to a teacher or two teachers to read and then they're going to share that out. And then you're having scenarios such as this. Jose and Jamal are horrible four-year-olds. In the playground, they're arguing over who gets to ride the scooter next. <clears throat> they're holding and pulling on the scooter and they're screaming at each other, stop, Jose, it's my turn to ride. I've been waiting a long time. No, it's not your turn. You, you're always riding the scooter. But I never get a turn. So how will you intervene? Which options will you use and why? So here we're gonna look at going to a framework of ignoring, 
ignore them, let them find out. Restructuring the environment, for example, restructuring the environment, we might take the scooter away and say, you know, scooter is just going to rest a while in the shed. Or we could restructure the environment saying, you know, outside time, don't we're all going to go inside. Or we could direct the behavior. Jose, you've got it for five minutes, and then Jamal, it's going to be your turn. Or another way of directing it is, hey, and Jamal, neither you get a scooter. Jamal, go play in the climbing structure. And Jamal, you can go to the, to the monkey bars. Or you offer them kisses. You can share five minutes each with a turn, or you can neither one of you ready someplace else. Or the fifth option is problem solving. So what are your ideas? Could we change this? How could we solve this problem and change this fighting over it? And there's a number of video clips. These are, I have all four of these that I like a lot. Um, these are just raw footage. And the first one, for example, Peaches Tantrum, a little boy spills his peaches um, during lunchtime and the teacher throws them away. He wants more and then he goes complete and milk. Now, difficulty at time, the same little boy as Peaches Tantrum and uh, he is refusing to nap. To nap. So you, each one of these is a good example that you could show your teachers or they could do in advance. Then you could have some discussion around it. Okay, so I've gotten a whirlwind structure of how you can address professional development remotely. I recognize that this is just some ideas that you can pick and choose from, but um, we're welcome to follow up. And um, there's my email address and Fernando's email address that I'm perfectly open to sharing ideas and structuring with you. Uh, I am. Um, an independent consultant providing training with programs uh, during non-COVID-19 times. I specialize in environments and class and projects and studies, mostly that I do. So I know we're a little bit over time. Uh, Fernando, do we have any additional questions we should address? We do, thank you, John. And uh, I want to take the, the opportunity to um, to thank for everybody for your patience. I know we're, we're having some connection issues uh, with audio specifically, so I, I do appreciate your patience as we navigate this um, this uh, this issue. So we, we do have some questions and, and um, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in if you're logging out, but we wanna make sure we address as many questions as we can live. So one of the questions John asked, was this session geared more towards uh, Head Start children only or would it work for early Head Start? Good question. Uh, I structured the presentation using examples from for Head Start teachers, but all of the principles would apply to early Head Start teachers also. You're just going to your framework, your scenarios, your, it all be geared with ins and towers. So, uh, for example, I talked about class analysis and reasoning. You might take the language modeling. So I find one, one of the big problems we still have is the use of parallel talk and repetition and extension. We're not doing that enough. Or how you take the daily routine. Your daily routine basically is your curriculum with infants. And so how you take that. So the same structure of having a focus, going in depth with it, providing some curated readings, providing some scenarios, providing some video clips, all of that also applies to early head start. Excellent, thank you so much. So the next question asks, are the video links you share available in multiple languages? Mm -hmm. No, they're primarily English, although um, head, the Head Start uh, video clips are, some of them are in English and Spanish. Um, there's a, a teacher from New York City, Jose, who's a male teacher who does, who speaks his bilingual classroom and he speaks to the children both in English and in Spanish. I do not know of uh, video clips off the top of my head, especially in Mandarin or Cantonese. I would suspect there are some in Spanish, but 
I don't have that information. Great. Um, so let me go through the Q&A real quick. Um, so there's a question that asks, what is the ideal number for a small group? Since this is, a, this is new for us. For a small group remote session, That ideal number I would say is eight to 15, stretching it to uh, 20 for interaction. When you get up to just giving presentation, uh, so for example, right now we have, uh, in this session, we have 275 approximately. So I'm just giving information. I'm not getting feedback from you. So if you're with a large grantee with hundreds of teachers, you can do something similar to what I've done, but then I would follow it up with some interaction with maybe the center directors, um, then doing some follow-up interaction using the scenarios and using the video clips. And then they, at that level, it could be in groups of 10 to 30. Once you get remotely and in person. Once you get above 30, people tend to not be as involved. I found, and you probably found the same thing in the in-person professional development sessions that you attend. When there's 30, 35 less, people have ownership and they're involved. When it gets to be a group of 50, 75, 100, it's real easy to check out and to be listening sometimes, but also your mind is elsewhere. Great, thank you, John. Uh, given that we're uh, experiencing some connection issues um, and we do have a pretty a good amount of questions that came in, thank you for sending those in. Uh, let me go ahead and close this session given that we're past the, our schedule time. And now we'll make sure to uh, uh, type these questions in and send them over to John. And once I get some uh, clarification, some responses, then I will uh, send them your way. So thanks everybody for taking the time and sending those questions in. Uh, I want to thank John again for the wonderful presentation uh, and thank you everybody. I know it, it was a challenge uh, with the connection issues, but I appreciate you uh, sticking through. Um, I would like to remind you once more that this session was recorded uh, and will be made available for on-demand consumption up on our YouTube channel uh, within 24 hours usually. Um, and you may access our YouTube channel by visiting our website at www.region.com. Dot org. Uh, and then you will scroll down all the way to the bottom of the homepage and you will find a link to our YouTube channel where all these recordings will be available. Uh, lastly, visit our website to register for any additional sessions that we have coming up this week and next week. And just to address some uh, common questions, there will be a certificate of participation available for this session up on the website, the same website. Um, in just a few minutes, as well as the PowerPoint slides, uh, which contain all these useful links. So look for, look for the uh, title of the webinar up on our website and you will find all these resources. And thanks again to John. Thanks uh, again, everybody. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, uh, look forward to hearing back from us if you submitted any questions and we were able to answer them. Thanks again, John. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And if you do have follow-up questions and you want to email me directly, you're welcome to do so. Have a good day.